So I wanted to start out this morning by introducing you to a couple of people, if we can get the slide up. There we go. Uh, black screen. I wanted to introduce you to a couple of people. These are two people I do not know personally. They are two people that I have only recently become aware of. person on the right, you see there, is a gentleman by the name of Beckett Cook. I'll talk about him here in a second. However, I wanted to talk about the person on the left first. This is an actress turned actor. Yeah, you heard me right. An actress turned actor. Ellen Page, who now goes by the name of Elliot Page. Back on December 1st, she came out as he, stating, quote, I want to share with you that I am trans. My pronouns are he slash they, and my name is Elliot. I feel lucky to be writing this, to have arrived at this place in my life. He or she went on to say, quote, I can't begin to express how remarkable it is to finally love who I am enough to pursue my authentic self. Now back to Beckett Cook. In describing his background, Beckett said, quote, with a highly successful career in a production design, as, as a production designer in the fashion world, I, fi I finally lived as, I lived as a fully engaged gay man in Hollywood. I had many boyfriends over the years, attended pride parades in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York, and marched in innumerable rallies for gay marriage equality. My identity as a gay man was immutable, or so I thought." Unquote. In 2009, at the invitation of a stranger he met in a coffee shop, he visited an evangelical church in Hollywood. Beckett states that he, quote, walked into the church, a gay atheist, and walked out two hours later as a born-again Christian in love with Jesus. For the past few weeks, we have been in a brief series focusing on the Holy Spirit. So often, we as believers tend to look at the person. So often we as believers tend to overlook the person in the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world and in our lives. Two weeks ago, we conducted a survey of the spiritual evidence, or the, excuse me, of the scriptural evidence for the Trinity and the Holy Spirit in particular. Coming to understand that the Spirit is not some impersonal force, but rather a vital, inseparable third person of the Trinity. Last week, we looked at the presence of the Holy Spirit, where we came to understand that the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit affirms the relationship that we have with the triune God. This morning, we turn our attention to the purpose of the Holy Spirit, and we turn to John chapter 16. And so if you would turn with me to John chapter 16 and follow along as we read verses 1 through 15. John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. This is what Jesus says. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. 
But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, sorrow fills your heart. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come before you knowing that ultimately all truth is sourced in you. We come before you knowing that Jesus said, as we have been reminded, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we come to you understanding that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So Lord, I pray that as we get into your word this morning, that you would help us to understand your word and the truth that it reveals to us. Lord, I pray that you would bless the message. May these words accurately reflect the text and the words that you desire to be communicated. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we turn to the purpose of the Holy Spirit, I want to make a little bit of a disclaimer. What I'm sharing this morning is not an exhaustive list of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purposes of the Holy Spirit are much broader and much more vast than we are going to cover this morning. We touched on a number of purposes in the first week of the series, and we touched a little bit on some of the purposes last week. What we are going to focus on is what Jesus describes as some of the purposes of the Holy Spirit, focusing on a text that is a vital starting point, a vital foundation to our understanding of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Our text this morning reminds us that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to ground and guide believers in the midst of perilous times. As this chapter opens up, we see that Jesus is communicating some of his final words to his disciples. He's just finished telling his disciples about the response that they would receive from the world. In John 15, 18, Jesus says to them, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. This word if can be rendered when. It's the assumption that the world will. Jesus is telling them that this hatred is the result of the truth that the disciples were not part of the world system. Those who were associated with Jesus and his kingdom would be hated 
on account of him. In John 15, 26 and 27, the verses right before our text this morning, Jesus then promises that the Holy Spirit, the helper, the spirit of truth would come and, quote, testify about me. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is rested or established in the context of trials and difficulties that are sure to come. We would like to think that becoming a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, will result in a blissful, blessing-filled life. We want to believe that by praying a prayer of repentance and belief in Jesus that we will have all of our difficulties wiped away, that we can walk down the street like Gene Kelly singing in the rain. Many spiritual hucksters and con artists exist peddling a gospel of easy believism. They assert that if you are sick, depressed, or poor, it is only because you lack sufficient faith. After all, they claim a good father would never allow his children to go through pain, sickness, or poverty, and you are a child of the king of kings. If you have sufficient faith, you can speak to the sickness and tell it to be gone. You can speak to your wallet or bank account and tell it to be filled. No true faith-filled Christian will ever be sick, poor, or despondent. Yet Jesus tells us something completely different. He tells his disciples, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. John 15, 20. Then he goes on to say in our text, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue. Imagine if Jesus said that they will make you outcasts from the church. This is the equivalent today to what Jesus was saying back then. The synagogue was the center of religious life for the disciples. It was the place where they would come to receive instruction in the scriptures and to engage in relationships in the religious community. They were part of something bigger than themselves, both in terms of time and purpose. To be excluded from the synagogue would be to be, to be prohibited from being able to benefit from the most essential and central part of Jewish life. They would be outcasts, not dissimilar from lepers. Perhaps another analogy would be to be banned from associating with your closest friends and family. You would always be looked upon with disdain and ridicule. For people who have been created to engage in human relationships, one of the worst forms of punishment would be to be separated from those relationships. Even beyond this, Jesus goes on to say that the hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These disciples would live to see the time that the religious leaders of their day would not only cast them out of the synagogues, but would also kill them, believing that they were doing so out of, an, out of an act of obedience to God. I won't take the time to go there, but you can see this begin to take effect in Acts 7 and 8 with the stoning of Stephen and the persecution initiated by Saul. 
in our lifetimes, we have seen and will continue to see people whose lives are ruined, whose reputations are destroyed, and who have been driven into bankruptcy because they choose to stand for biblical truths and the accurate proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may even see a time when our own lives will be on the line here in this country because of our identification with Christ. Let me take a moment to be transparent with you. When I read the first four verses of chapter 16, to be honest with you, I felt a bit scared. These aren't words that I enjoy reading. Think about it. The hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that they are offering service to God. Be honest with yourself for a second. How does this make you feel? I dare say you likely are not feeling a tremendous, you're not feeling overly enthused at the prospect of suffering. I'm not overly enthused about that myself. It's all the same. I would rather pass away quietly in my sleep if I had the choice. However, if we were to truly understand the purpose for the Holy Spirit, for which the Holy Spirit has come, we must realize that the purpose, that his purpose rests in the context of trials that are a part of identification with Christ. As Jesus turns to the purpose of the coming Holy Spirit, we see two specific ways in which he engages with humanity. The first is more broad and general, and the second is more specific to believers. Jesus tells his disciples that he is going away, which is beneficial to them and by extension to us because his departure paves the way for the coming helper. Then Jesus says this, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The word convict here can also be rendered to rebuke or reprove. Hence, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to rebuke the world. Jesus says that we see this in three specific ways or in three specific areas. First, the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning sin. If there was a word that the world that is being effectively banned from the lexicon of the world, and I dare say from even many of our churches today, it is this word, sin. The world wants to revel in whatever deeds it deems acceptable, and it wants no commentary from anyone on those deeds unless it is approval of those deeds. Paul states in Romans chapter 1, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. In the same context as our well-loved as our well-loved John 3:16, Jesus says in verses 19 and 20, this is the judgment that the light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear his deeds will be exposed. In this context, Jesus is referring to himself as the light. Jesus has already stated that the world does not know him. We saw last week when 
Jesus gave the reason the world has no ability or will to receive the Holy Spirit. We see in in chapter 15, verse 21, that the reason the world would hate and persecute Jesus' disciples is because, quote, they do not know the one who sent me. When Jesus, takes, when Jesus states that the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin, it is for a very specific reason. It is because they do not believe in me. This would be the height of hubris for Jesus to make this statement if, in fact, Jesus were not God. The Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin because they do not believe in Jesus. But Jesus is, in fact, God. The reproving, rebuking, convicting work of God the Holy Spirit exists because the world places no trust in the divine person of Jesus. The central work of the Spirit in relation to the world Convicting them because is convicting them because they have not the teaching not the teachings of Jesus, but rather they have not believed in not the teachings of Jesus, but they haven't believed in the person of Jesus. If you take away Buddha, Buddhism could still exist because it is founded on the teachings of Buddha. If you take away Muhammad, you could still have Islam because it, Islam advances the teachings of Muhammad. However, if you take away Jesus, you could not have Christianity because Christianity is founded on the person of Jesus Christ. The purpose of the Holy Spirit concerning sin is that he rebukes the world for its first sin, unbelief in the person of Jesus. Second, the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning righteousness. Jesus tells us in verse 10 that this is because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Now, what connection does Jesus going to the Father and our no longer seeing him have with conviction concerning righteousness? Right standing with the Father comes only through the redemptive work of the Son, Jesus, as revealed by the Holy Spirit. Let's see what the writer of Hebrews has to say on this. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Perhaps one of the weightiest books in all of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. The writer of Hebrews states this. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Here we see Jesus' death acts as a better sacrifice for our redemption than the blood of goats and bulls. Those sacrifices commanded in the Old Testament were but a picture of the ultimate fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of the sacrifice that was made by Jesus on the cross. 
Christ's ascension, his departure to the Father, means that he serves as a mediator of the new covenant that was purchased through his own blood. In Acts, in Acts 4, verse 12, as Peter is standing before Annas and Caiaphas and the rest of the religious leaders in Jerusalem, he tells them of the crucified and risen Jesus. And then he says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. When the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning righteousness, he is pointing to the truth that not in our own actions, that we cannot trust in our own actions and devices. Righteousness can only be found in Jesus Christ. Jesus ascended to the Father so that those who are in Christ can be declared to have a righteousness that is not their own, but is received by faith. This is a truth that the world rejected then and that it is rejecting now. Consequently, the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning righteousness. Third, the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning judgment. In verse 11, Jesus says this. He says, it is because the ruler of the world has been judged. So often we think that we are the center of the universe, that God's plan for the ages is only about the redemption of fallen humanity. While we are indeed part of God's plan, we are, we are only that, part of God's plan. The redemption of humanity is not the only reason Jesus died on the cross. The wrath of God is poured out, and when it is, it won't simply be on the, when the wrath of God is poured out, it won't simply be on those who are not found in Christ. God's plan is not just about us. It is much bigger than that. If you recall back in our fall series on the gospel, I alluded to the fact that humans are not the authors of sin. <clears throat> sin didn't begin with humanity. Sin was present in the world prior to Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. God, being perfect in holiness and justice, will ultimately and finally judge not only sinners, but also the source of sin, that is Satan, whom Jesus refers to as the ruler of this world. The purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit is to rebuke the world concerning judgment because the one whom the world embraces by rejecting Jesus has been judged. This is a judgment that has been accomplished in the past and the impact of this judgment has been felt ever since. John writes in 1 John, 1, 1 John 3, 8, the one who practices evil is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. The work of the Holy Spirit in convicting the world of judgment points to the destruction of Satan and his works. All of this brings me to the third point, which we touched on just briefly last week. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to remind us of the truth. We saw last week that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. That, that is to say, He is the very embodiment of truth. We see this name reiterated in John 15, 26, and once more in John 16, 12. Three times 
In Jesus' final words to his disciples prior to his crucifixion, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth. Connected directly to, Jesus, to the Holy Spirit's designation as the Spirit of Truth is the promised purpose that He would guide us into all truth. Jesus doesn't say that He would guide us into some truth. He doesn't say that He would guide us into our own truths. No, the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, will guide us into all truth. When Karen and I first moved into our house here in Lyons, we discovered that people had a difficult time trying to find the house. As a matter of fact, when we had made arrangements with the realtor to tour the house, I knew how to get there because I had already checked out the house, the real estate agent was late because she had a hard time finding it. GPS doesn't get you to our house. Even though GPS in other situations is relatively accurate, for some reason it is not get in getting to our house. Google Maps doesn't even work because our house is so new. Oddly enough, it points you close, but it doesn't get you all the way there. We would have to get people to our, we could get people to our house because we had already been there and that was our home. In a similar way, we learned that the Holy Spirit can guide us into all truth because he resides in the truth and he is the spirit of truth. On our own, we would be lost in our pursuit of the truth. Our minds are unable to pursue the truth apart from the knowledge of the one who is the truth. We need to have our eyes opened. We need to have our ears tuned to hear the Spirit so that, so that we can be guided into the truth. Jesus says one more thing. This truth into which the Spirit guides us is not his own truth. We, use, we hear this term today, this is my truth. That may be your truth, but this is my truth. But the Spirit does not speak his own truth. Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will di disclose to you what is to come. The Father will not contradict the Son. The Son will not contradict the Spirit, and the Spirit will not contradict the Father and the Son. The triune God speaks with a unified voice. Each member of the Trinity speaks with one voice, communicating one purpose. If you hear someone say something they claim is a revelation from the Spirit, and it does not align with Scripture, and it runs contrary to what Jesus says, you can be sure that it is not the Holy Spirit speaking. Look at John chapter, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. John writes this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God, but every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard 
that it is coming and is now already in the world. The spirit of truth has reflect, as reflected in the purpose of the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth is the representation of the cohesive purpose of the triune God as a whole. Not only does the Holy Spirit's reminder guide us into all truth, but it also guides us to the triune God. Somehow this slide didn't get updated, but that's what that point should read. It also guides us into it guides us to the triune God. One of the things that amazes me about reading John chapters 14 to 16 is just how phenomenally triune these chapters are. Reading John 14 to 16 is like looking at a magnificently intricate tapestry. We see the personalities and purposes of the triune God on full display. It is nearly impossible to separate the Father's purpose, the Son's purpose, and the Spirit's purpose from each other in, the, in these passages. And perhaps it should not even be attempted, for in doing so, we might inadvertently destroy the tapestry. We see this tapestry represented in a couple of statements that Jesus makes towards the end of our text. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Do you see the interplay here? You see the intricate working of the purpose of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. We see that the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son by taking the things that belong to the Son and literally informing us about it. The things that we have, the things that we know, the things that we understand, we know and have and understand because we have been guided to them. They have been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. However, these things ultimately come from the Son? No, they ultimately come from the Father. The Son is glorified because the Spirit discloses the things that ultimately come from the Father through the Son. The truth into which we are guided has its source, its foundation in the triune God. And one of the things I find absolutely amazing is that the work of the Holy Spirit does not stand on its own, doesn't stand on its own purposes. The Holy Spirit does not exist for himself. The Holy Spirit exists to glorify the Son, and as we see in Philippians 2, that the Son glorifies the Father. An intricate, magnificent tapestry, and our connection to that is that the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son by revealing to us the things that are passed down to us through the, from the Father through the Son. A relationship with the triune God. Let's go back to the story of Beckett Cook. In coming out as a born-again Christian and writing a book about his new life, Beckett stated, quote, my, close, my closest lifelong friends completely abandoned me, and my production design agency in Hollywood dropped me like a hot potato under the most vague and frivolous of pretexts. Even though I was one of their top artists, 
earning them loads of money over the years. But what did he gain? He said, yes, the loss of close friendships and a lucrative career were harsh, but being in the kingdom of God more than compensates. I am royalty, an heir of God, a fellow heir with Christ. In contrast to Paige, my joy is not fragile in that it depends on the affirmation of others. My joy is secure because I am in Christ. So, and thus favorable in the sight of God, whose approval is ultimately all that matters. Jesus promised his disciples that he would send a helper, the spirit of truth to fulfill very specific purposes in the lives of believers specifically and in the world more generally. The Holy Spirit rebukes the world because of sin and righteousness and judgment, and he reminds believers of the truth, guiding us into the truth and to the triune God. This ministry, these purposes, however, take place in the context of trials and difficulties. As I'm sure Beckett has learned, and I pray that we learn also the purposes of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit foundationally is to ground and guide believers in the midst of perilous times. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the purpose for which you sent the Holy Spirit. We thank you for examples of people like Beckett Cook, people who were living in deceit, people who were not acquainted with the truth, but people who you reached down and touched, whose lives have been transformed because of the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that in the difficult times that are sure to come, you promise us the Holy Spirit is a helper. You promise that this helper will convict the world because of sin and righteousness and judgment. These are certainties. These are not mere possibilities. We thank you, Father, ultimately, that you promise that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, the truth that has been handed down from you through your Son and made manifest to us by the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would teach us to hear the Spirit, teach us to have our eyes opened, our ears opened, so that we might learn to walk in the Spirit. We thank you for the purposes of the Holy Spirit, and we pray that our faith would be grounded in the truth, because we have humbled ourselves before the purposes of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.